Well, good morning. Yesterday we had two, uh, a presentation that essentially set the table for the red light, blinking, kind of team building, and then of course the flight into the Hudson. Today's presentation is kind of a continuation of that in that we're going to be dealing with physician integration. And we'll try to define what that means. Uh, it does apply directly to the emergency department and emergency physicians. And I will explain because some of my current clients uh, are working towards uh, dealing with hospital institutions. These are individuals that are not part of a large corporation that are still solo practitioners. So those of you that are in here that are involved in that, we're going to delve down to another level here in this presentation to deal with uh, a subject called co-management. So let us move to the approach that we'll take here. Now what are essentially the trends that we are seeing out there? Essentially these are the issues that most physicians face and most senior leadership within any type of institution, whether it is a hospital or a clinic or any type of arrangement that is delivering patient care. How many physicians in here are directly employed? How many independent practitioners do we have? Good, those are still the kind of groups that you have, so we have a few there. But the trends are, and I had some sidebar conversations this morning, continue to be that you will be in some state of employment into the future. Now that may be because some of the residents that are coming out, actually a majority of residents that are coming out, based upon the latest data, indicates that they want to be employed, either because of debt load or, or lifestyle or things of that nature. Potentially even that the majority of the physicians in the uh, medical schools now are, are women and in some of the residency programs, depending on where you are. So again, it's a lifestyle situation there that people are choosing to go down the employment route. But besides that, there's the issue of bundled payments. Has anybody been involved in that yet, in working with bundled payments? Okay, the testing models are still going on. I think we're closing them down. Um, I've worked with uh, Michael Zucker, uh, actually not directly in, every, in his day-to-day -day operations, but in meeting with Michael, talking through with him. Michael is from Baptist Hospital in San Antonio, and he's been doing some of the uh, progressive uh, bundling of payments, putting them all and packaging them together so that the actual payment models are changing. And if you read about bundled payments around the country, I won't get into too much detail of what that's all about. You essentially kind of see how both hospitals and physicians need to come together, along with the community physicians and the whole continuum of care, to look at how they're going to be able to deal with essentially one payment structure for particular procedures, for particular approaches in medicine. Accountable care organizations, I know you've all heard about these. Essentially, again, I have enough gray hair to kind of think deja vu that some of the concepts and foundations of accountable care can be dated back almost 15 to 20 years ago. And in fact, there are some models. I come from Northeastern Ohio, uh, where uh, SUMA Healthcare and a few others have already progressed down that road, Kaiser models, as well, where they've actually been able to put together total continuity of care approach. And lastly, we'll talk about co-management. And that's our focus today. Because it's my belief, as I go around the country, I see that there's still a number of independent practitioners that are out there. But even if you are in an employed situation, you can deal with the uh, concepts of co-management and be able to then approach particular challenges that your institution may have. We heard a lot of yesterday uh, about team building in the morning throughout the uh, general concepts of communication, also the kind of clinical aspects of changing approaches that we take. Co-management will allow you to actually sit at the table and talk about those issues 
and see how, how financial incentives come to bear as th through this approach. Um, and that's what we'll talk about today. So that's kind of the overview. When you're dealing with any physician integration approaches that you might take, here you can see in the slides, it's a very simplistic approach. But essentially you have the issue of practice control on one end of the continuum and then predictability of income. And these are the trade-offs that you see. Very simplistic, but again, you give up kind of the uh, uh, control aspect as you go down this sequence when you get into the employment role, but it is more predictable income, and I would have to say even more predictable lifestyle as well. Now, when we deal with the concept of co-management, I wanted to put out just this basic definition so that everyone here has a kind of a level set approach. It's an arrangement. It essentially tries to recognize and appropriately compensate physicians to participate, whether they're individuals in some cases, or groups in the efforts of developing, managing, and improving quality issues. Now, it could be clinical procedure changes that are happening here. I don't necessarily know when I work with organizations what their particular drivers are. It kind of comes out through the first end of the process, which we'll talk about. Now, I'm not going to be doing all the talking this morning. I've actually reached out, and this is how I like to work. I reached out to one of my clients who's actually gone through the process. Who's been to Santa Fe, New Mexico? Anybody? No. One person? Santa Fe? I'll bring Bruce Tasson here, who's the chief operating officer there at Christus. Uh, he'll come through through some videos that we'll talk about, lessons learned, how he made mistakes, how he improved things, um, and we'll, we'll, we'll see how Br Bruce reacts to all of this. Dave? This is the mind of a particular senior executive this officer. Right here. Cat herder in our family. Herding cats. Don't let anybody tell you it's easy. Anybody can herd cattle. Holding together 10,000 half wild short hairs. Well, that's another thing altogether. Being a cat herder is probably about the toughest thing I think I've ever done. I got this one this morning, right here. And if you look at his face, it's Maybe. just ripped to shreds, you know? You see the movies, you hear the stories, it's, I'm living a dream. Not everyone can do what we do. I wouldn't do nothing else. It ain't an easy job, but when you bring a herd into town and you ain't lost a one of them, ain't a feeling like it in the world. In a sense, this is what we do. This is retro. Who's seen that presentation before? You're, you're all feeling Vegas, I can tell you. Hands are just not going up at all. This was a Super Bowl commercial about 15 years ago. But essentially, it strikes the point, which is, how do you get people to be focused? Remember we talked about being in a team yesterday and pulling things together? In the mind of any senior executive now, whether you're a physician or a non-physician, whether you're a nurse, whatever that may be, you're essentially in a situation where you have to bring people together to do something, to do something different. Don't get me even started on innovation and creativity just to get through some of the basic approaches that we need to take on any given day. So let us kind of go into one of the tools that you could use to do that. And that essentially is here with the co-management approach. There are varied definitions and outcomes of this, but essentially what we're looking at, it is the, the way that you can look at creating a team of individuals, both from the clinical side, the business side, as well as the community side, to come together to work through issues that will allow you to achieve the goals that your organizations need to achieve. 
But before you go down that road, you need to kind of define its scope, where you want to go with this, whether these are inpatient issues, outpatient issues, whether your organization has single or multiple sites that it has to deal with, and whether or not it is fit for your culture as well. Because some of the things that come to the surface are not always things that will be accepted by your organization. If you come to grips with that early in the process, you will therefore be able to kind of work through that. There's history and structure there, the details behind uh, some of the corporate arrangements that you have, the demographics of your community. I took a brief survey before to see who was employed and who wasn't. Again, going back to just my general roots, in Ohio, approximately 65, in Northeastern Ohio, sorry to define that, in Northeastern Ohio, approximately 65% of the physicians are already employed. Those that are not, are not necessarily sitting back and thinking, well, when is my turn to come? Many of them are being aggressive in their approach and are starting to work with, physicians, with hospitals to come forward with some of the issues that they see that can be changed. The interesting thing is they want to be compensated for it. They want to have some incentive for being there. So we define those uh, physician drivers, what those particular deal breakers may be for both institutions throughout the process. Has anybody in here worked through a co-management arrangement? If you don't mind, what area was that involved in? What particular area? Okay. I, I just, I like talking to folks. What are, we, what are you doing with that piece? Well, just leave in an apartment co-managed with the administrative lead. Okay. All right. What was just defined for both the cameras and for the audience is essentially a situation where you're, you're actually involved in sharing the ideas and the management of the de particular department. Is that what I heard? Okay, thank you. What I'm trying to do though is actually get into more of a, of a, of a visceral approach that we can take to actually see what issues are, can be available to make particular changes that need to occur. And we'll actually get into this in a second. So, You need to categorize those co-management services. They can follow on any service line that you might want to think about. So if you're thinking about creating something different, some outreach program, you can use that. These are beyond just medical director and leadership uh, situations. Many of those medical directorships are now under the uh, review of the OIG because they actually want to see what you're doing for those particular uh, amounts of money that you may be receiving. This tries to define that even further, but if you are into a situation where you need those leaderships, it helps you to support what those may be. Additionally, it helps you with community relations and education, and working out there in the communities, uh, pa patient and physician and staff satisfaction, as well as the surveys that exist, clinical protocols, staff scheduling and supervision, which is always an issue, workflow process change, we heard some of that yesterday. Uh, it really works well in trying to define how we can improve things within our organization. Credentialing process, material management, what we use, how we use it, what we use it for, things of that nature. Again, the overall approach to case management as well. And this helps out with medical staff relationships, both within the organization and the community also. The objective is to define a position of the parties, to bring them together, to actually sit at a table. And as I progress here with Bruce in a minute, he'll tell you how you kind of walk through all these processes, the lessons learned, who he is, how he succeeded, et cetera, and what mistakes he made along the way. When you work with an organization, again, whether they're emergency physicians or any type of discipline, essentially you're getting into a situation as what are we trying to change here? What are we trying to improve here? How can we work together to do that? So you look at the, what you have chosen to look at and work on, quickly having a go, no-go decision. 
no need to spend time on doing things that you know are just not going to be in the cards for either one of the uh, people sitting around the table. That you can't find some common ground. Don't waste your time on that, especially if you're starting these things off new in your particular situation. Know the limitations that you have, particularly data, how you're going to actually measure things that you've approached here. And we heard a lot about data yesterday morning. But this is more financial data. This is bringing together what the actual outcomes are, value of, of the services driven, and the quality of services that are approached. Um, you then move forward with contractual and legal. Uh, this is part of arrangements that are actually be put in writing so people can know what they're working for and anybody that would come into the situation at any time in the future would know what was done a year ago, six months ago, et cetera. Especially if you're being audited by anybody uh, throughout the country. Uh, key hospital leadership will be interviewed in this process and as you can see it goes through a number of steps including defining examples so that you can instruct physicians exactly what are you trying to accomplish here? What is this kind of co-management arrangement? Are you just calling something a little bit different? No, we're helping to truly define something that can be worked on by the group that has focused on the issues that face their particular community and institution. As you can see, there are some other issues there that, that are involved, but the last but not least, of course, is to find the potential steering committee members, the right people that will be on that committee that will drive to see the success and to organize the operations. Phase one of this whole process when you go through clinical management is there defined for you. Essentially, you're looking at within that steering committee development and those key leadership people that are in that meeting they can look at the composition of who they are, their particular liaisons to other departments throughout the organization so that they know the change is coming. Particular meeting schedules so that you can adapt to all the particular schedules that are out there. Some of the most difficult things is everyone getting together and use, utilizing technology conference calls and things of that nature that allow people to talk and to share ideas. Non-disclosure of information, especially if you're dealing with independent practitioners, those that are not affiliated, those that you're sharing ideas with. So that if an institution, if I'm a CEO of a hospital and want to work with you as an independent practitioner, let's sign off on this so that we can share ideas and be very candid with each other. And of course, clearly define those outcomes, benefits, priorities, and goals that are there. Um, You'll get into some legal aspects of this. I will not talk in any great depth about the legal piece to it. We only have a, a 45 minutes for this morning. Um, but it is something that needs to be looked at almost immediately throughout the process. We look at it both from a compliance standpoint, tax law, inurement, and benefits, and then actually signing a memo of understanding or MOU to proceed with the process. The objective, again, of the steering committee is to bring all this together, um, set up the meetings to document it, to draft those testing me metrics that need to be out there. What are you measuring? What are we going after? And the timeline for a work plan. As you can see here in the approach as well, it's just further defined for you. So just to summarize very quickly, what I've walked through is kind of a definition of what co-management is one of the pieces of physician integration. One of the things I think that you as independent practitioners out here can get involved in. But the concepts and approach for those that are employed can be also applied to the things that you're doing within your operations as well. Now let us go on to the actual case study that we're looking at here. And this will be Christus Healthcare. Again, only one person has been to Santa Fe. It's a beautiful city. It's just a place where all the um, Hollywood people go to kind of retire. I walk around the streets, you can see some very interesting folks that are there. Uh, Christus is a part of, uh, well, St. Vincent's Regional C Hospital Center is part of the Christus Healthcare System. What I was able to do with Christus was to define their complete playbook of how they were going to work with all the physicians across all their, uh, um, 
uh, multiple hospitals throughout the uh, state, uh, working there with the, st with the staff at the corporate. Here at the uh, Vincent, uh, St. Vincent Regional Medical Center, you can see the definitions of how many people are there and what the approach would be. You and I today will now meet, or you will meet, Bruce Tassin. Here's kind of his definition, but I'd like Bruce to actually say in the first video, Dave, who he is and what he's all about. Go ahead, please. Sure. Uh, I've been with Christus uh, Health for 20 years now. Uh, I actually started in the central Louisiana region back in 1992. Uh, two years ago, uh, Christus did a partnership with uh, St. Vincent's Hospital here in Santa Fe. Uh, and I was asked to come as part of the new leadership team, working with the existing leadership team uh, in the transition. And so I've been with uh, Christus St. Vincent's for two years now. There, there's the traditional employment aspect. Uh, now uh, we have the options of looking at co-management agreements, JVs, uh, as additional options. You know, in, in our community here at Christa St. Vincent's at Santa Fe, probably about four years ago, the organization looked at the employment model of physicians and started employing docs. Today we have 80 practitioners employed. Uh, that's physicians and extenders, uh, anywhere from family practice all the way to neurosurgery. Uh, so really, St. Vincent was a little bit ahead of the game on the employment of subspecialties. I really think it's the relationship building with the physicians within the community to determine what is the right model. Uh, there are some docs who are looking at an opportunity of saying, you know, I've been in the, the uh, private practice model and really looking to get out of the uh, hecticness of running a practice and looking at what are the needs within the community for the hospital. I think the key is, is the integration with the doc of the three models, what works for them along with the hospital to ensure that you provide appropriate community care. So there's no one right answer. I think it's really a cross section of the needs of the community, the needs of the physician and the needs of the organization. Bruce has an interesting office there. You can see that he doesn't clean it very often, but Essentially, he wanted to make sure that his organization was successful. So he took a multiple approach, and one of his parts of his toolkit was to be able to go forward with co-management. He is relatively young. He is a dynamic individual. As you can see, he's not into too much pomp and circumstance. That was right in his office, right after we were working with folks. He doesn't necessarily wear a tie. He gets out and meets his physicians as often as he can. He works very directly with all of his senior leadership, and he was able to pull in a very short time an entire co-management arrangement with multiple disciplinary approaches uh, to his particular organization. Um, his second piece is it doesn't always go smooth. There are always some challenges that exist out there. When you're starting to look at all of these arrangements that may happen, whether they're employment. So if you're thinking out there uh, whether uh, about a third of you are in independent practice, whether you work with a physician or work with a hospital organization or not, want to co go into an employment arrangement, co-management is a step along the way that will allow you to kind of test those particular waters, to really look at what the beliefs are behind the organization to allow you potentially to make a decision of a go, no go. Uh, those of you that are already employed, it'll allow you to kind of bubble up those ideas to work with uh, organizations to see within your own contracts that exist. Now, some of you may work for some of the national chains. I particularly have clients, ED clients, who are now taking a more ex uh, aggressive stance, being uh, more uh, proactive in trying to reach out and actually taking over other arrangements and essentially competing with some of the nationals on a regional basis and are having some significant success in those areas using some of these concepts as they go forward because they need to communicate to those organizations what they could possibly bring that would be a different what would be the differentiation between our group and your group and how can we be rewarded and achieve metrics based upon successful operation of those particular issues. Let's go on to the second video with, with uh, Bruce. And he talks further about what he's all about and what he tried to accomplish here with one of his groups. 
You know, when it comes to the co-management uh, aspect, I mean, this is really an excellent alignment tool for both physicians and the organization as we provide uh, better care for our community. Uh, it's really a partnership. When, when you look at the co-management aspect, it's saying, hey, who, who best can provide the input to ensure that you're providing the best quality of care and service for your community than a partnership with the physicians and the organization? At the same time, under the co-management, it still gives the autonomy of the independent docs within the community uh, to be able to go uh, about their own business on their private practice, but also as they work within the hospital, within the outpatient setting of the hospital, the ability to help direct the services and the product line. You know, as an example, we recently signed a co-management agreement with a local GI group here in Santa Fe. Uh, this group in the hospital had really a, a long-term uh, disagreement, if I may say, in regards to philosophy. And so the hospital was at the point of having to go out and recruit a whole new GI group to the community. Now when you look at the community need, there wasn't a need for an additional group to be brought into the community. But unless we worked together, then that was the end result. So. In the co-management, we were able to show the physicians that we really valued their input, we valued their expertise, and we knew they could help us grow the overall program within, within the community. So really aligning that partnership and saying we will grow together, we will be both successful, we will be able to help the physicians in the recruitment aspect of bringing more docs in, bringing more technology in, and ensuring at the end of the day they were at the table in regards to driving where the service line will go long term was very beneficial. Two aspects of that particular video clip there. One was the word that Bruce used was uh, autonomy. Uh, again, for that third of the population in this conference that are independent, um, that is an important word. Uh, you can achieve that, as he pointed out, uh, through this arrangement and the details that are in there in, in your uh, handout and syllabus today. The second piece I wanted to reinforce to you is many of you are in leadership positions within organizations. Did you hear one of the subtle things that Bruce mentioned? He was faced as a senior executive with the potential of having his renegade GI group, and that's what he didn't really say, and having to go out and bring into the community an entire new group that compete. It didn't make any sense to him. But you will see this constantly. You will be on boards for those of you who are at that particular level, or you'll start seeing things within your communities. They'll say, hey, we, and it, it's not necessarily GI, it can be any of the disciplines. It can be a situation where you know a particular group, say neurology, or somebody that's at a, uh, at a, a, a situation where the physicians within that group are retiring, at that particular age, how does the community, which he is responsible for, react to that? Do we go out and buy a whole other situation? Do we bring people in? Do we employ new docs? How do we respond to that? You in the, in the emergency departments know who are the strong services that are out there, who are potentially the weak services out there. How are you dealing with the changes that are happening in the environment relative to those physician groups that allow you to respond to that? Do you want to be more proactive or do you want to start looking specifically at that blinking red light that we saw yesterday until such time as strategically you may not have made an appropriate landing? Bruce wanted to take a more uh, progressive approach here. He used this very well as a tool within his particular arsenal. Uh, let's move on then. Uh, he did his due diligence. You saw at the beginning of the slides all those kind of detailed approaches, uh, kind of stepped through bullet points. That's there for you to take back to your organizations and say, hey, this is one of the things that we have uh, see at our particular conference. Um, but he also did some more due diligence, and it didn't always go well. If we can play the third video of this, and Bruce will explain that to you. You know, the first step that I took was to try to get to know my docs. Uh, this GI group, when I first got here two years ago, uh, I really had no knowledge base uh, 
of their past practice, past relationships in regards to what worked, what didn't work for them in the current relationship with the hospital. So it was really setting up one-on-one -on -one meetings with the, the leaders of the group and, and asking them uh, in, in their mind what has been the barrier in the past for us to work closer together. So it was really building that relationship and building a relationship of trust that my goal ultimately was to see how could we align as partners long term. Uh, and that process actually took probably about six to eight months to really get a comfort level on both sides. And you really started seeing that there was a lot of alignment between the institution and the physicians. Uh, and so those were the first steps that we took. There he reinforced his key strategy components that he had going well, forward. I'd say with the, the key to it is, is uh, really understanding the previous relationship, what were the previous mistakes that were made in the past between the relationship. Uh, I, I think the, the primary key was though is showing the group that there was a change. Uh, my, my philosophy has always been uh, previous relationships, whether good or bad, are sort of like water under the bridge. And that's something I did not want to cross at the time. I wanted to start fresh in saying that, hey, we're here to find ways how do we work closer together. I think the other piece was is as the different groups, as an example, the GI group, had concerns and issues, then it was empowering uh, us to make change to show them that we were going to move forward with uh, a new environment of change and that we really corrected a lot of the things that they they couldn't get corrected in the past from previous leadership. So proactively working with them, proactively uh, showing them that, hey, there is, this is a new day. Uh, we are here to provide the best patient care for their patients in this community. So it was really working with them to say that there has been a change and we're moving forward. He had the uh, positive situation where he was relatively new to that community so he could go forward and start working with physicians. Now, one of the other subtle things he mentioned besides just his strategy going forward was physician relationship management. It's so soft that people don't quite understand its importance. But let me ask you this question. When was the last time both the nurses in this group, senior leadership people, as well as physicians, that the senior executives of the organization came to you and say, what one thing can I do to make your job better? What one thing? So just one thing. Let's not get into all, I don't, I don't want to be on the blinking light that we saw. Just talk to me about the one thing that I can do to change your life. Bruce gets that. He went out to his community physicians. If he couldn't do it directly, he delegated other senior people around him to do that, to communicate with people. We heard a lot about communication yesterday. But just to say, what's that one thing that this institution can do to change your life? That starts an entire process to where as he essentially got notes and notes and notes of approaches he could take that worked into his co-management arrangement. Now, he didn't do everything right. He has some lessons that he needs to, to go through. And we'll go through this last video of Bruce and the lessons learned and then have some open discussion of what we've achieved here today. Yes, I think there's two key components that we probably would have done a little bit differently. Uh, number one, we would have brought in our legal uh, department in sooner rather than later. Uh, we actually had a, a third party uh, consultant come in in regards to do a presentation about certain type of relationships. In doing that, uh, we actually displayed potential numbers for uh, co-management hours worked, incentive hours, medical directorship. And so it puts a preconceived thought process in the physicians when they see that, that that's the numbers that they will be working towards in regards to the co-management for time worked. And that would be the major change we would have, whereas 
legal would be on the front end to say, here's the guidelines with uh, around a co-management agreement, and here's the steps you take before you get to the true valuation stage. I think the commitment through following through with the co-management agreement uh, is going to take focus. Uh, for an example, the co-management agreement requires for us that the leadership council, which is made of five docs and five leaders, that we meet monthly and we look at what are the opportunities in regards to new service line development, uh, cost savings opportunity, clinical quality improvements. It's ensuring that, number one, we're all committed to meet monthly that we have an effective agenda uh, that's aligning us with what we want to achieve and that we're following through with that agenda. Additionally, there needs to be subcommittees that are formed out of the Leadership Council to work on some of these larger projects and we need to make sure that we keep those committees on task, that there are regular reports back to the overall Leadership Council to ensure that we're achieving what we need to because the ultimate goal for us was, was to improve overall access for our community and high quality of care. And it's looking at, as we measure and as we work towards a common goal, are we truly achieving that? So it's really staying on task, on focus with our monthly meetings and ensuring that we are progressing as we said we would. So as Bruce brought his physicians to the table to work with him, and in that particular example, he focused on his GI practice but he's worked at, with other disciplines as well, with other service lines. It's amazing what he's been able to accomplish. Uh, some of his contact information is there. Essentially, we were helping to work with him from the beginning throughout the entire process. And on, a, on a occasion, we get to come back and tinker with some of his ideas, mostly via phone calls and things of that nature. So these are some of the approaches that you can take specifically co-management and the arrangements that can work out in the community to allow you to closely align both the physician and hospital arrangements. Now I have a few minutes left here. Any questions that, uh, specific to this approach? Again, if you're already employed, you can work through these models as well. Yes, sir. The question that was posed to us was, has hospitals branded their emergency group? That's why, in some capacity. The answer to that question is yes, but it becomes, a, in my opinion, what I see is the ED approach, and you are the gatekeepers to a lot of the revenue, all right, that occurs, that's quite obvious. It becomes kind of a subtle piece. It's not seen as, hey, we are the greatest cardiac center in the world, we are the greatest neuro, it doesn't happen that way, it's much more subtle. What I see, and I had some sidebar conversations this morning with the independent practitioners, and if, if we could talk offline, they've actually created their own marketing programs of their own practices. So that when they wanted to get into a situation where they're not defending their turf, but expanding, looking at those independent hospitals that are there, they approach it designing kind of a marketing tool. It's, it's, it's some great stuff that they're doing. In addition to that, they bring in the co-management arrangement to show hospitals how they can work together, what they see the issues are. And then they show them the metrics at the end whether they're quality, historical quality issues that might have occurred, they bring those to the table. Look what we're doing now, all right? Compared to what you're doing currently. And then by signing off the uh, non-disclosure agreement, the hospitals will actually share that data with you as independent practices. I don't know if you, if you know that. They will, they will say what their struggles are, even though they're on contract right now with some institution, because they go through a contract cycle process, right? Now we're talking about institutions that may be in a one or two hospital town, could be three, but are not associated with these kind of large medical complexes that are out there. So, so 
it's always subtle branding that the hospitals do for their ED, ED departments, um, unless they're opening a new building. Institutions love when they're going to open a new complex, and then they, it's a freestanding whatever, this and that. But the physicians behind it get lost sometimes. You know, they get lost in it. Who, are, are, are they really board certified? Or where are their credentials? Are they just picking them from place to place? I mean, what, what's the situation? You know the uniquenesses of some of, some of the uh, physicians that are in your, your particular arrangement there. Another question, please. I thought I saw another hand go up. Anything else? Anything on the details of, of arrangements with co-management? Again, it's another tool. Oh, go ahead. Let them give that. So, you have. Can you start where you come from? A European background. That was good. Sure. <laughs> we, we're working for Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi. And we come from a okay. nursing European background, um, and so everything we know about teamwork and success. One of the things that appears strange to us, at least, is that interdisciplinary working and leadership is not always the norm. In we, in the states, would you say yeah, that? In, the, in states. the states, right? And so, for us, we find that really strange. We can't imagine going forward without working really closely with physicians, whether they're salaried, whether they're independent, whether they're, whatever the arrangements are. That, that to us seems strange and a kind of no-brainer. Um, and yet I think still, even working with Cleveland Clinic sometimes, you know, physician-led, etc., cetera, um, it's not always the case that interdisciplinary working is the norm. So we have to keep reminding people to say, no, we have to do this together. This is not an activity to be done in isolation, either as a group of nurses or a, group of physicians, I think that's a poverty-stricken approach to take. So it's just a reflection on that. So, you know, we kind of sometimes think, well, why wouldn't we do it that way? We can't right. think of a, uh, of a better way to do it than working alongside people, whoever they are, whether it's physicians, support services. Uh, and I think that was kind of reflected in your videos. So. Right, right. Uh, but, so, but you could see where he, Bruce, was in a community that was fairly independent a yeah, lot sure, of sure. and that's the yeah. uniqueness that we face yeah. in some communities yeah. and uh, and uh, they they have a lot of these struggles yeah. within talk to me a little bit about Abu Dhabi would you are you looking at arrangements where people have incentives to well, do in, things in the Cleveland yeah. clinic model the the physicians are salaried they're, they're, they're there's in, no incentive whatsoever to do no, anything the else. incentive is patients first and you know, delivering a great service. But that doesn't mean to say interdisciplinary working necessarily comes easy to people. So although we might see it as the norm, it isn't easy. And I think when you look back to some of the work of people like Senge, the idea of independence is actually a nonsense in my mind. Because you, know, you can't have great um, physician care without great nurses or allied health professionals. And you can't have great nursing care, similarly, the other way around, or great physician care. So I just think it's one of those interesting, interesting things to think about. You know, why don't we do it in a way that is supported from other literature? Right. And it's a constant struggle. However thoughtful and positive you are about interdisciplinary working, um, multidisciplinary working, whatever you want to call it, it's a constant struggle. Yet it's the thing that we know will make the difference. Thank you. Um, whether it's in a hotel or whether it's in healthcare, <laughs> mm -hmm. we know it makes the difference, and it's hard to do. Let's, again, let's not pretend it's easy. It's hard. Vested interests, uh, politics, professional boundaries, all of those things are difficult. But if we don't talk about it in a way that we can help each other and reach accommodations, we'll never deliver a, a world-class service. Thank you. Well, I'm over my time now, so... Um I will be available throughout the day. I kind of sit back over there and I thank you. This is just one tool in your arsenal to think about this morning as we get into physician integration. Um, I assume that another speaker will come up or yeah. I'll just keep going. So, yes, yeah, Dr. Thank Brett you very Aspen, much. Paging Dr. Aspen.